Start a recording. Right, Martin. Okay, cool. Thanks, Martin. I hope everyone's well. Thanks for coming to this session. Um, so I'm here to talk about GoGM, which is the Global OER Graduate Network. Uh, and we're going to sort of talk about different ways that we've um, used open practice within the network itself, really. Uh, so all four of us are going to be talking today and hope there's, there should be some room for some interactive elements, uh, but just not in my part because you know, I'm an old stick in the mud. So um, the structure, we're gonna, so I'm going to just give an overview of GoGN to kind of bring you up to speed, those that know about it, and particularly what we've been doing this year during the pandemic. Uh, then Paco is going to talk about uh, the fellowship scheme, which we launched this year. Uh, then Beck's going to look at um, some open practice uh, and a sort of more interactive element. And lastly, Rob's going to talk about some research outputs, uh, particularly the, uh, he talked about the research methodology handbook that we produced yesterday, I think building on that and what we're doing next as well. So uh, introduction to GoGN, that's me. So um, that's our website there, go to gogn.net. Uh, um, the aim of the Global OER Graduate Network is to support doctoral research in open education uh, across the globe. Um, and it was set up and it's funded by the Hewlett Foundation and it was set up by Fred Mulder from the OU Netherlands and then handed over to us at the uh, OU UK. Um, and really the idea was that particularly when uh, OER was a, a fairly new field, it was the idea there wasn't kind of much research happening in it. There's lots of kind of advocacy, people saying, isn't it, is it a great thing? And all these things will happen as a result of OER, but not much research on how people are actually using it, what the impacts were. Uh, and Fred and, and the Hewlett Foundation really want to kind of try and grow that uh, research community. And they felt the best way to do that was to kind of try and fund this um, global network. Um, and I think that's been a, a sensible approach really, because actually, um, doctoral research are, are, are researchers are the kind of future and they're, they're sort of people then go in to kind of shape how it goes along so i'll talk about a bit about what we what we do this just kind of gives uh, uh, the history i've just mentioned uh, so the aims are to raise the profile of research and education to offer support for those conducting phd research but also to try and develop openness as a process of research so that's kind of a key area for us um, so it's not just about you come in, do your bit of research on OER or MOOCs or whatever, and then disappear. But we're trying to get our researchers to operate in an open manner as well and to consider aspects of openness. And we've got um, over 100 doctoral students who are members and, and alumni now. And, uh, and also we have this group of experts who are people we call friends of the network. They're not doctoral students, but they're people who are interested in uh, OER as well. So, um, what we usually do, uh, we have an annual seminar, which is usually allied with the OE Global Conference. So right now, we should all be in Taiwan. Uh, and we bring together about 15 uh, students every year, and we try to balance that between people at different stages of their PhD research, people from different areas uh, of the globe and things. So we're trying to bring people together, and they all present about their, their research. And it's a very kind of uh, comfortable relaxed atmosphere they can present about the research and any issues they have any doubts they have and receive feedback from the uh, the other participants and also we run a few kind of sessions around uh, becoming a, a, an open researcher and it's allied to the conference here so usually it's very global it was also we did it with oer 20 uh, oer what was it 19 in galway i can't remember <laughs> seems so long ago um uh, and then a lot of the members can go on to present at the conference and we kind of give them access to the conference as well. So it's a kind of a really uh, formative experience for lots of people. And often um, the researchers who are doing this kind of research will be the only person in their university, sometimes in their country, who are actually interested in OER. Uh, so this is a really good way to kind of meet other people with similar interests and often they kind of form lifelong bonds and kind of form uh, groups, subgroups around particular methodologies or conceptual frameworks, these kind of things. So, so the seminar, I think, is the kind of the, the crux of what we do, the kind of the main thing. But also we run uh, monthly webinars. We've got a very active Twitter account. We send out newsletters with updates. And we produce resources and share them. And we try to foster this very kind of supportive network. And we run uh, some awards, which are coming up now, uh, named after Fred Mould as one for best uh, paper published by a member and best uh, open practice. And um, generally, we try to encourage open practice and share resources. So that's the kind of, that's what we do. 
so I mentioned the kind of uh, the, the seminar, which kind of forms the main feedback. Um, and we, we run, as well as the kind of students present to each other, we run these sessions on uh, different things like open practice. We run practical ones where we had um, how to get published and had someone speak from the Roddle. Um, we've got together some people who were who just completed their PhDs and given advice on how to survive a PhD and also how to get jobs, things to do after, uh, after a PhD as well. We try to mix in kind of practical advice as well. Uh, so just some facts, uh, currently 113 members. Um, so we've had four face-to-face -face seminars that we've run. Um, there was one, two run, I think by Fred before we took over. So the ones we've run have been at Krakow, uh, Cape Town, Delft uh, and Galway. Um, and we, so we bring about 15 researchers to each. Um, we've had over 30 webinars we've run. Uh, and just last year alone, there were 44 publications from uh, GoGear members. So you can see it's kind of it's demonstrating quite a kind of critical mass, and, and it was good to see uh, OER 19, which is the Galway one, uh, over the conference. There were 31 presentations from GoGear members, so they were real kind of uh, real presence at that conference. Um, and then along comes uh, 2020. So the plan was that we were going to come to Galway. Um, we were, going to come to, we were going to come to Taiwan and, and bring people there and have a nice time and everything. And also we were planning to have a one day smaller seminar associated with uh, OER 20 in London, but of course then the pandemic hit. So we've been trying to change what we do slightly this year. So we ran that uh, OER 20 seminar online, a one day seminar. Um, one of the things we, off, we offer at the face to face meeting is we say to people after the two days, do you want to have a, an individual catch up and discussion with um, the GoGM team like Rob, Beck, Paco and I, um, just to kind of talk through any issues they might not want to raise publicly. Sometimes that's about, you know, worries they have or issues with supervisors kind of things. Uh, but of course we couldn't do that. So we offered individual catch up sessions online that I'm able to us up on. Um, we produced a research methods report, which was produced by the members and Rob will talk about that. And he did a very good session on it yesterday which has been really successful and has had over 6,000 downloads. And we launched the fellowship scheme, which Paco will talk about, um, as well as the research methods report. We did a research review report in the summer um, where we uh, got together a number of OER research publications and got members to review them and produce those reviews into one document. So that was kind of a really nice uh, resource that we could share back with the community. Uh, we got everyone who was a GoGM member, we uh, signed up with ALT, the Association for Learning Technology in the UK, and they automatically get um, ALT membership as well. Uh, we had a really fun session at the, the ALT Summer Summit, which was their online conference in the summer, uh, which was called a Gaster session for anyone who's been to that. It's so run by Tom Farrelly. There's these kind of five minute lightning talks, and Tom gets everyone to count down uh, to five in, in and stuff. It's really good fun. Um, so that was, again, kind of really good presence for the session now. We've given uh, our members, if they want it, um, a free reclaim hosting account for two years. They can generate their own identity online. I think that really ties in with the idea of open practice. We've run a number of webinars. Uh, we got the OE Global Award uh, for the report, uh, the methodology report. Um, we've launched the Fred Moller Awards. Uh, so people are now applications that come in. I think that closes tomorrow, is it? Um, we got the fellows to present about their work, which was starting in October. Uh, we've today been running uh, a seminar for new members. We did three this morning, we'll do three this afternoon, which is where they can present about their work. Um, and at the end of the year, we're going to do a, a kind of annual review stroke celebration. Uh, we produced a really nice pack, I think. We've given all this stuff away and doing all these different resources and all these different communication channels. Uh, but often it was kind of the information about that was distributed. So we've produced a pack that we can give to members. So this is all the things we offer. And we'll sponsor places for people to attend the Alt Summer Summit and this uh, global, uh, kind of global conference. Uh, so, we, so what we've been trying to do is like replace some of that kind of face-to-face -face activity with online activity, as well as things we have plans. So uh, the, the membership pack that I mentioned, we set out, it sets out the benefits, you know, the, I just mentioned such as membership of Alt, something we can host in, different communication channels, and also the different uh, uh, resources. So you can see the that's the link to the uh, to the pack there. We we'll try and get people to share. Uh, someone can stick it in the chat. 
Uh, so I think it's just interesting to kind of reflect on this year, kind of we were, although we did a lot of activity online, that face-to-face -face, um, seminar was a kind of key activity for us. And often we'd see a spike in activity in terms of people applying to join the member, join the network, the, the number of tweets, number of increase of followers of, of Twitter and those kind of things. Um, and it, because other people will be talking about the, the, you know, the seminar and tweeting about it and those kind of things. Um, so we have to, in some ways we have to try and replace some of that activity, I think. But I think one of the good things, we, it wasn't difficult for us to know what to do in a way because we already had this very well-established community of care. And so, um, you know, we're very much, I think, I'm sure I speak for the members and we have a, a WhatsApp group as well where they're always kind of sharing stuff. And so they, they look after each other and we try to look after them as well. So I think we kind of knew what to do. It wasn't like, I think some organisations have struggled to know what to do online when their, their role is to sell people things. It's like if you're trying to sell services, suddenly what people need is just you know a virtual hug. That's a kind of very different thing, I think. So we, we transferred some of the action online, some of the activity, I think. Um, and we also tried to find some, <laughs> you can hear my dog snoring, and he's, he's, he's impressed. Uh, we tried to find some new activities to kind of replace that. And I think to kind of keep a kind of constant activity stream going, but also to try and support our members, I think, during what were difficult times for them, uh, both in conducting their research and just kind of you know, in their work lives as well. Uh, one of the things we, we've seen is that, um, some of that activity, such as producing those reports and sort of having a bit of a presentation around it, creating activity, has replaced some of that activity spike that we usually saw with, with the seminars. Um, we think this way of working is sustainable, you know, it, so it, it shows that it's not uh, completely reliant on it being a face-to-face -face event. Um, I wonder whether it's more difficult, we don't know this yet, so we're, uh, we're running our survey at the moment, so we're getting feedback from uh, members, but one thing I, I suspect it may be more difficult for new members to kind of break into a, a group that's kind of sometimes well established. I think that's easier to do when you meet people up, you know, in Cape Town or whatever, and you'll go out for a meal or drinks together, those kind of things. Then you, you sort of become into that group. So sometimes it can be more difficult for new members. So, for instance, um, the sessions we're running today, we explicitly um, invited new members to give their presentations. I think sometimes they might hold back and wait for the other more established people to, to do those presentations. Uh, I think it takes more effort to, you know, although organising people to come to a conference is a lot of kind of administrative effort, I think it requires a more kind of constant effort from us, I think, to kind of maintain the community when it all shifts online. Um, just in case you're wondering what all the penguin graphics are about, so this is the GoGN penguin. It's a stressed penguin that we give to our members. Uh, so it should have, it should say GoGN on his belly, but you can see I've been quite stressed, so I've worn it away. <laughs> um, and it just became part of a brand really when we were doing the uh, the drawing. Um, and this, uh, so you can see a lot of the images and that are freely available for you to download that Brian Mathers has created. Uh, so you can, you can play with those. Uh, good, so that was my intro to it. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Paco now, so I shall stop sharing my screen. Paco's up next. Thank you very much, Martin. I'm going to share now. Okay, you should be able to see now the... Uh, the presentation. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, briefly about the fellowships, which are a uh, work package for new this uh, new phase of GoGN with the um, the idea uh, to support uh, GoGN alumni and members in the last step of their PhD, and uh, that means as well uh, after they have finished until a period of approximately three years, so we can support. That, uh, that movement uh, between uh, finishing your, your PhD and moving ahead to a postdoctoral career. Um, so the idea is we have uh, already uh, announced the first round of uh, fellowships in this scheme. Uh, it was an open uh, uh, contest during the summer and one of them was uh, safe for the Global South applicants. So uh, the fellows have started already uh, science October and uh, it will run until uh, March next year and the benefits uh, include the uh, financial support uh, for them as well a promotion uh, through the GoGN website and 
the idea is that they uh, can be based around a specific piece of relevant research that we're going to discuss now and as well uh, get the support from from the network to uh, organize uh, and uh, and uh, be able to promote the network and as well uh, think about the uh, the ways to support the research and the general uh, framework for the scheme is that the uh, the, the fellows uh, should be able to undertake a, a piece of research in the area of open uh, education and any kind of related research in, in, in the area uh, and as well can be about particular uh, focus on, on regions and uh, involves identification of events and connections with other networks uh, uh, different than GoGN. Uh, the idea as well to promote uh, GoGN and and the objective uh, as well if possible to get uh, new members and increase uh, the network. It's important uh, um, the fact of uh, uh, following uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, recommendations and guidelines from the network. And uh, well, some of the uh, outputs that uh, uh, we are expecting for the fellows are uh, regular reports back to the network, which are uh, oriented to allow reflection and, and think of the ways we can we can uh, keep supporting uh, their fellowships and, and we can have a bidirectional communication to uh, to help the research. Uh, several inputs uh, in the GoGen uh, website in the way of blogs. We already have the first round of blogs. You can have a look to the website. And, and finally, the production of a, a output review report at the end of, of the fellowship. So um, you are probably know uh, over four fellows from this first round. Uh, I think uh, I'm not gonna go in depth in the research because uh, they are around in the conference and can talk to them and we have uh, uh, the blogs uh, and, and yeah, information. But I think it's interesting to realize that we got uh, uh, four fellows from uh, four different uh, continents. Uh, so four women who are presenting different uh, 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 proposals, uh, Joe and uh, Virginia have uh, followed that approach of a proposal that continues from their PhD. So uh, it's a first step to that uh, postdoctoral career in the terms of following with uh, part of the research conducted uh, during the PhD. Uh, in the case of Joe, uh, so the evaluation of learning OEP. Um, so to uh, evaluate that impact on a student's employability skills. And in the case of Virginia, um, the researching experiences uh, of teachers using uh, OERs and UR repositories in Uruguay during this uh, uh, pandemic time. Uh, in the case of Judith, uh, she has chosen uh, that path of, uh, of uh, networking and, and promoting GoGN and see the impact uh, uh, in Africa in a project where she's involved uh, at least for the next three years. Uh, she was telling us that they already have more than 20 partners uh, involved. And uh, one of the perspective there is how we can actually help uh, Judith in terms of, of promotion and, and producing materials that can be helpful to, to uh, potentiate and, and expand the network. And uh, Chrissy proposed uh, a, a slightly different uh, um, uh, fellowship, which uh, initially wasn't like framed in the areas, but that uh, as well shows the flexibility when uh, we get a, a good idea and a good proposal in terms of developing a collaborative uh, a storybook uh, with the with the objective of raising awareness in open education in in young people, and uh, with a group of uh, of uh, quite a lot of people uh, who are actually uh, as well in the conference involved in that. Uh, in that proposal. I think it was very interesting uh, as well to have the presentation yesterday from Karina and, um, and Vivian for the phase two of uh, the AI um, uh, production in Latin America. And one of the aspects in, uh, in the area of uh, diversity was uh, um, that uh, in Latin America, it seems that uh, the use of English as a language is not really helping to expand the network. And uh, so we are aware of that uh, aspect as well. And and one of the things from, from the fellowships as well is trying to promote uh, the, the blog posts in several languages and outputs as well. And that's gonna happen as well with the storybook, which is gonna be uh, designed to be uh, uh, available in, in different and multiple languages.
And now I give the turn to Beck. Thanks, Paco. Um, if you're able to just move the slide on as well, thank you as well for helping me um, with this. So, um, hi, my name is Beck Pitt, and um, I'm going to just be spending probably about 10 minutes on um, an open practice interactive. Um, and just, yeah, to um, flag up in the chat box as well. Um, yeah, there's lots of links to get involved in um, the uh, storybook project as well and contribute to that. Um, Paco, could you just move on to the next um, uh, slide? Is that all right? Thanks. Oh, I think that's the... Thank you. Okay, lovely. Thanks so much. Um, thank you. So this is really an opportunity to hear from you guys um, in the audience. Um, and um, it's great to see so many people um, in this session. Um, as Martin mentioned, one of the things um, that we try and do um, as part of GoGN is um, encourage and talk to people about um, uh, practices around open research, open research practices, um, and encourage kind of people to maybe possibly be more open in the way that um, they conduct their research. And this is something that we do um, and spend time um, in sessions, for example, at um, our annual workshop, um, talking with people and um, kind of doing activities um, around um, this. So I thought we'd take a couple of minutes um, just to hear from um, you really um, about what open research um, means to you. So I think, um, People can type in the chat box. I'm not sure. I think we can unmute people as well, I can see. So um, it was just really to give the opportunity um, to hear from you um, about what you're doing and um, what perhaps open research um, means to you. So I'm just going to open that up to people um, and hear if anyone wanted to share some thoughts. Um, and this will kind of scaffold us into um, what Rob's going to talk about in the next section as well. So just pause it there um, and see if anybody's got anything that they wanted to share. Um, you can, yes, you can all unmute yourselves if anyone wanted to, to speak. Oh, fab, thanks, Bear. So yeah, it's about sharing aspect, aspects of the research process as Martin put. Um, we've got a research cycle as well, um, just in case anyone needed a prompt on um, a slide that's coming up. Lovely, thank you. So we've got a couple of suggestions coming in. Um, thanks, Gino. So Gino says expanding the reach of good information. So yeah, getting out um, what we're doing to as many people as possible. Thank you. Um, and Bea as well, like reach, you know, we're reaching out to as many folks as possible. Um, not only about academics as well. Thank you, Bea. I think that's really important. I think um, one of the things um, we need to think about quite often is how do we, um, what kind of message do we say, how do we present our research to different, um, different people? Um, Danielle, thank you. So having the courage to publish with an open license and the trust in the research community and balancing that, that's a really important point, thank you. Because um, I think obviously it's not just about <laughs> kind of saying that you must be um, open in everything, um, that you do is about thinking carefully um, and um, as other people have kind of pointed out negotiating um, that process and really thinking about um, uh, what openness means every point in the research um, cycle. Um, Rob says I think openness can be seen as a general scientific virtue. Um, Barbara says transparency trustworthy reaching out. So yeah about transparency as well I think that's a really nice point around um, around um, that kind of element of sharing and being open about um, uh, what we're doing, the transparency that enables, for example, um, uh, replication of um, certain approaches um, and methods as well. Thanks, Rob. Openness can also be a catalyst for networking and collaboration. Yeah, that's great. I think, um, yeah, hopefully, <laughs> But um, there's lots of different opportunities um, at this event as well for um, kind of networking and collaboration. Um, and I think that that's a really, you know, um, one of the really fantastic things about um, 
about openness more broadly. Um, Bea says, helping others to build on your knowledge. Um, thank you. That's a really great point. Transparency, kind of um, letting people know how you did something, kind of guiding them through that process enables other people to both replicate and then to build on what you've done um, as well. So that's a really great point. Um, lovely. Thank you. So. Danielle's also made a really good point um, and connected to some of the other points that we've seen um, as well in the chat, um, which are great, which is around open access, um, you know, and you don't have to be associated with the university to be able to consult the literature. And I think that's a really important point around, you know, accessibility of information um, so that people um, are beyond universities or, um, you know, who aren't able to, um, uh, access um, uh, uh, academic literature are able to do so through things being on, on um, open licenses and openly available. Um, and yeah, thank you, Gina, making opportunities for change visible. I think that's a really important point, um, you know, around um, uh, transformation um, and how we, um, you know, and giving visibility to different types of work that's going on um, to show what change is possible um, as well and um, sharing that as widely as possible. Um, that's really fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing um, those. I'll, I'll just pause a moment in case there's any others. I think there's some really wonderful um, suggestions from people in the chat. Um, and I think that this gives a really kind of, um, uh, rich and interesting picture of the different facets of um, open open research. Um, Paco, I don't know if you can move on to the next slide a moment as well. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Danielle, also here. Yeah, as you say, even if you're, even if and that's a really good point, even if you're associated with uh, two universities, you know, more than one university can be really difficult to get hold of what, what, what you need um, to do your research, depending on what subscriptions libraries have got or what access there is to different things. So yeah, it can be really challenging, even within an institution. Um, so yeah, it's, it's um, yes, <laughs> it is a bit like a cartel. So that's, um, Thank you for all those comments. I think that um, what um, we would, if we were kind of continuing this discussion um, through, and I'm conscious of time as well, so I'll hand to Rob in a moment, is we'd kind of look at different phases of the research cycle and, and kind of talk in a bit more depth about where we thought we might be able to be open um, at different um, stages of, um, of the cycle. I've put this lovely um, quote here from Cheryl um, Hodgkinson Williams and um, Thomas King um, around open research, um, which is quite useful as well to show just the range. And we've heard about this in the chat as well. I think it's fantastic um, what people have been sharing about that it is this kind of um, process all the way through the selection of research processes, literature reviews, methodologies, the instruments, the frameworks, um, and how we share and disseminate our research. Um, you know, as well as um, thinking about ethical approaches as well. And that's really a fundamental part of um, open research, um, thinking about how we can build in um, ethical open, um, how ethical open practice throughout um, our research. Sorry, Paco, could you just move on to the final slide? That'd be great, thanks. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just to show you the research cycle, oop, just got slightly clipped, I apologize for the um, slide there. Um, but yeah, just the process through and kind of thinking about, um, as we've heard from people in the chat, there's lots of different ways in which um, we can think about um, uh, open research and look at different aspects of um, the process of research as a whole and think about how maybe we could be more open um, in different ways and build that in early on to the process um, as well. So I'm going to leave it there um, and thank everybody for sharing all their ideas in the chat. There were some really great examples there. So thank you. Um, and thinking about publishing and thinking about outputs, um, I'm now going to hand over um, to Rob, who's going to talk a bit more about research methodology. Thanks, Rob.
Robert, you're still muted. Okay, um, so yeah, I'm going to um, talk a bit about some of the research outputs that GoGen has produced uh, recently, and also um, facilitate a bit of a discussion around uh, research outputs other people could potentially be doing, and also other things that we could be doing if anyone's um, got any ideas uh, or any inspiration around it. So. Um, we've had mention of the Research Methods Handbook uh, a couple of times, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this um, in a way it's a potted version of the presentation yesterday, um, which if you want to know more about this handbook, um, I suggest you, you can look it up or you can just um, have a look on the GoGen website where there's a lot of information about it. Um, but essentially the, uh, the Methods Handbook was produced in response to um, demand from members at one level, because a lot of uh, members that approached us, uh, often privately, to say they really weren't sure about research methods, and they just didn't feel confident um, around what they were doing. Um, and what was striking was the fact that lots of people individually sort of said this, but no one was that comfortable saying it kind of openly, if you like. Um, so what we tried to do was say, okay, um, we can provide some sort of guidance around this, but really the interesting thing would be to draw on the um, experiences of our members. Um, and we've got lots of alumni who've now finished their doctorates, who've used various research methods in their own work, uh, and we could collect um, insights from them, which we could use to, you know, produce a resource for everyone to use. Um, so uh, over the last year, um, roughly, we've been working on this and uh, we did have a plan to have some face to face sessions back in April, where we would kind of brainstorm stuff and we kind of, you know, um, work collaboratively, collaboratively to produce this. Uh, in the end, most of it was done online, but it actually worked maybe even better that way because it meant more people could be involved and could have a more of a, um, a sort of collective approach. Um, so uh, there are sort of two parts to the handbook. Um, the first part, which was um, written by the GoGN team, uh, covers some of the sort of theoretical basis for doing research, some of the philosophical foundations of research, I think tries to sort of explain why it's complicated um, and um, uh, take you from that point to uh, a more structured way of looking at it and um, a way of working from just an idea through a research paradigm through to a research design. Um, and what we try to do uh, in this book is um, try to make sort of complex and scary material uh, a bit more approachable and accessible. And we did this partly through just a kind of um, uh, a sort of a style which is um, a, a bit more um, a bit more accessible and a bit more everyday than most of the uh, literature that you'll encounter about research method. Uh, but we also had this visual style um, which uh, uses the, the fabled penguins um, and the idea of a penguin's journey through a kind of potentially hostile landscape, I suppose. Um, um, we tried to use these, this visual side of things to, um, to make the whole thing a bit more approachable. Um, so here's an example. I think this is, this is an example, which is the, if this is the most complicated graphic we had, I think, um, and tries to show from a spectrum of um, sort of theoretical differences um, around what the conception of the underlying conception of truth is or how the um, how the sort of how different methods understand themselves to be producing insights and how that maps on to different um, research techniques and methods and um, throughout the book there's various ways that we've tried to sort of have similar ideas sim a similar presentation of ideas so the second half of the um, the book 
uh, is comprised of these insights from our researchers where we go through each individual method uh, that people have used and in their own words they explain how they use a particular method because a lot of the time they're applying it in a way that it wasn't necessarily originally intended for um, alongside their own insights so how, did it work or not if you were to do it again would you use a different method would you refine this method and so on um, so that output that methods handbook has been received very well um, the award we're, we're getting this week has been mentioned in in some ways the more sort of striking thing was how much the report was shared beyond our own network so we've got several hundred members but the report's been downloaded um, something like 6,000 times and we've seen it shared on Twitter and other places as well so I think we tapped into actually a wider need for people have to have this kind of guidance so um, so one thing we're thinking about is, is potentially doing another edition of the book next year where we could extend it we could have more um, uh, input from a wider range of people and cover more research methods and so on. Um, we're also um, planning to do a companion volume to this using a similar sort of crowdsourcing approach, um, but it would, it would be more focused on, on theories and how theoretical frameworks are used in uh, open education research. And um, uh, so First of all, on the penguins, if you want to know more about the visual style um, and the ideas behind it, where we tried to make it sort of accessible, um, there's this article uh, recently published in the International Journal of Management and Applied Research. Uh, also, the penguins and the other graphics are all available on open license for other people to use. Um, another output we had uh, this year over the summer, again, a sort of crowdsourced um, approach where what we did was, um, um, again, I think in response to member needs, um, we tried to provide a sort of digest of um, recent research in open education. Um, so on a voluntary basis, we assigned uh, reviews uh, to various people based on their own kind of interest and expertise. So again, we're sort of trying to leverage the expertise that's in the network for the benefit of the wider community. Um, and um, we're planning on doing more of these research reviews as time goes on um, throughout this phase of GoGN. And part of the idea here is that um, by the time we get to the end of that phase, we will have the methods handbook, the theoretical framework handbook, various research reviews from the last three years kind of compiled into one document. So you could have, actually have like um, a pretty useful single volume that we could uh, share with new members, for instance, and say, look, here's the sort of collective knowledge from GoGen in the last three years. Um, and I think that's a, a quite an interesting example of um, a sort of open practice, actually, because um, I don't know about other researchers, but that's not the way that I was taught to do research as a PhD student. Um, and sharing was not particularly the theme, right? during your, um, your PhD. So I think this is a really kind of innovative and, and inclusive way of doing things. So a sneak preview of the next one that's coming up. Um, so uh, I think in December, we'll be publishing the 2020 year in review. So we'll be looking at what GoGN has been doing uh, in relation to what we said we would do in our KPIs. Uh, obviously, there's a bit of a narrative around all this with the kind of, as Martin's indicated, with the pandemic and the impact that's had on what we originally intended to do. Um, we're going to try to amplify stories and achievements and publications from our members so that they get recorded and they get shared with a wider audience. Um, and same thing with our fellows, right? Capturing what they're doing and how they're achieving stuff um, for everyone to, to learn from. Um, and, uh, and also, I think, just recording just what happened this year, you know, our timeline. Um, these are all things that, you know, we know we do, but we don't necessarily write down and share. And I think it's, it's often the thing that has the greatest value beyond your immediate network is actually just writing it down and putting it somewhere people can find it. Um, so again, as if you think at the end of three years, you'd have uh, three years of reviews like this as well. Um, I think it could be quite, you know, quite a good uh, book at the end. So what I wanted to do um, 
that's my that's my description of some of our recent outputs. Um, and you can kind of see a pattern, right? A bit of bit of crowdsourcing, bringing people in, trying to share that stuff back to the network. Um, and I have, I guess, two two questions that I, I wanted to us to just have a general discussion around um, for the rest of this session. Firstly, asking, is there anything else that we could be doing? I know Martin's a fan of the interpretive dance, so we'll look forward to his contributions there uh, for the unconventional outputs. Um, but it's really a, you know, a chance to think, think, um, blue, sky think uh, blue sky thinking, what else could we do? Um, and what else could you potentially be doing along these lines uh, in your own practice? You might not be doing exactly the same stuff as us, but you might have the potential to um, to use some of these kind of crowdsourcing approaches, uh, for instance. Um, so, so yeah, I'd like to kind of just open it up really. What else could we be doing? And what else could you be doing? I can't see the chat. So um, if someone can, who can see the chat could help me out, that'd be good. I think Martin said something about baking your research and Bea mentions language. Did you say baking research, like a cake? That's what Martin says. Yeah, okay, you could like ice a cake. Well, have you seen it? It's a PhD thing where you, uh, they do like competitions. So we do one at the Open University, but they do it all around. It's kind of, I think it's this week actually, bake your research. You meant to like through any baked goods, bread. Bake off. Cake, you bake the idea of your PhD research representative and there is a uh, you talk about dancing there is a, um, a dance science thing every year the kind of where you um, through interpretive dance show off your science results and research so it's a uh, the, the COVID you. what I'll find you links I'll um, I do think there's there's scope for being more creative. We do generally just kind of, I mean, although we're doing it a little bit differently, they're kind of standard outputs, right? Books, um, papers, that kind of thing. Um, so I do think there's potentially scope for doing, you know, stuff that's a bit more interesting. Uh, I think the artwork that, that we get from Brian is kind of, is probably an example of the most sort of creative stuff that we have in terms of just, Un unconventional outputs. I think those artworks and themselves are kind of um, more creative than anything else. I'm gonna come in for a second since I'm tech support. I've got the power. Actually, everybody has the power, so you can all unmute yourselves if you wanted to say something. It's just quick, quickly, quickly to quicker to speak than rather to write. In. It, it's in connection with. Uh, so yesterday. One of the presentations was from um, Karina and uh, Vivian, and they were talking about the, the, the you know, diversity and and equity in 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 GoGN. And one of the things that uh, Vivian mentioned was kind of the fact that um, so GoGN wasn't really well known at all in in um, in Latin America, for example. So we kind of started getting into the idea. Okay, so. Um, is GoGN speaks mainly English, uh, and that could be one of the reasons why, you know, somebody in Latin America who does not speak English would not kind of feel that connection. So, so that I know this is difficult, but is it, is there something you're planning to do in order to address this? So how can how can uh, GoGN be more inclusive in that sense? As in, how can you open up? Um, all these research outputs, for example, to uh, to people who do not speak English. Um, yeah, you know, you, you know, you know where I'm going. Uh, well, I mean, I guess we have a lot of bilingual people in the network. Um, translation is something obviously can be quite time consuming. Um, but I can see how we could potentially sort of budget in to get people to do that sort of thing. My only concern would be if they're a PhD or a D student, that's quite a lot of time 
that they could be spending um, working for us doing that sort of thing. So yeah. Yeah, but no, um, but I'm I'm not I'm not referring to uh, obviously these guys are doing their PhDs. Uh, there's uh, and I'm not referring necessarily to translating outputs, right? It's it's how can you be more diverse in having that conversation, invite that conversation. The same conversation we're having here, for example, in English. How can you how can you help that conversation happen in other languages? How can you um, how can you be a bit less English, a, a, an English speaking organization? Since you are so, you know, Gojian is very international. Uh, it just happens that you know we are using English as as the main language of communication, but. How can you use your your members just to try and those connections, those conversations happen in other languages other than English? It's a suggestion. I don't know. I think Paco might have some points because Paco is talking towards the fellowship. So I think, for instance, um, well, that Paco speak, but I think Judith's fellowship uh, is really about promoting Gojian, and I think for us to develop resources for her to help sort of promote it from these kind of discussions and that would be in English but I think also we, but I think once we once we've got those tools we can say here are things that you can use to kind of like run sessions in your place and Packle's also been talking about uh, producing uh, uh, multilingual versions of the fellowship stuff so I don't know if you want to say anything back on that. Indeed, uh, we do did uh, one of the conversations we had is that uh, um, some of the partners uh, in her in her project yeah, use French. So the idea is to translate those resources in uh, Swahili and French, and and yeah, as I said, in the from the fellowships uh, as well. The idea is that uh, blog posts are produced in the uh, mother tongue or of the fellows, and and uh, with this idea of of keeping uh, the personal uh, touch and, and engagement. Uh, I think um, I think partly this is also an issue about the sort of size and maturity of a network. So eventually, I think GoGN could have more of a sort of modular quality or more of a sort of franchise quality where there's lots of different bureaus in different places. And in a way, we've 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 sort of because we've been growing, we're sort of on the cusp of that. And I can see how eventually you might, you might have these sort of chapters in different places that are more locally focused. So you might have a South American chapter, for instance. Don't know how that would work in practice yet, but um, I suppose sub subconsciously that's where I think it leads eventually. Yeah, it's a kind of franchise model almost. I don't know if you can see the chat, Rob, but uh, Jenny says, I feel like a crowd, just going back to your original question, what else could we do in creating? I feel like a crowd solution for alternative open focused assessments for this challenging time. Um, I don't know if Jenny wants to elaborate on that. Um, Danielle says providing guidance from writing techniques and styles has to communicate the research in different formats for best impact, both formally and informally. So I've been writing a, a micro credential on um, evaluating stuff and then disseminating it, Danielle. So my head's in that already. So now, I don't know if Danielle or Jenny, you want to elaborate on their points? Hi, everyone. So nice to see you. I just, it's Jenny. I just want to confirm that, um, you know, in my very pragmatic world, so many faculty members across Ontario, I'm hearing it across North America, are really struggling with how to assess in virtual environments. Um, they, many of them just can't get past the idea of multiple choice, high stakes, final exams. Uh, and I feel like there's so much power in, in, this, um, in this community, in this group's membership to, to think of open educational practices and to create um, templates. You know, faculty members are as stressed as anyone right now and, and very much appreciate inspiration and high quality examples. Uh, and it's, it's very hard to find open, um, good, high quality, open examples of those types of things. So I feel like this, this membership in this group has a lot of power to create something like that. This is we'll, we'll stick that one on, on, on the pile. I agree. I think it's maybe that's the next kind of big area and that might be one of the big kind of outcomes of, um, of the pandemic. Sorry, I dropped someone there. I cut someone off. Sorry. Uh, this is Danielle, and I 
before I say my part, I'll just agree with Jenny. Uh, a lot of profs really are focusing too much on, on assessments that could be replaced with, some, with things that are so much better. Uh, but what I was talking about was um, if there could be advice provided on writing, that would be fantastic. Uh, my writing skills were horrible before I started the PhD. Now they're just mildly bad. Um, so things about, you know, selecting the right vocabulary, using the right expressions, uh, knowing the right academic terms, knowing how to vary your terms, but without using the wrong synonyms, all of these things. Now that's just for the writing part. I also agree with Jenny about data visualization because too much reliance on text, I don't think is a good thing. I come from a science background where there was a lot of, of visualization. And now in the field of education with so much text, I find it very difficult to read and write. And then the other part was just uh, to provide advice on how to present the findings in different formats, in different locations, different types of conferences, uh, and formally and informally, sometimes on social media and sometimes in highly formal and maybe even political situations. I think data visualization is definitely something we could offer more support around and probably most of us would benefit from you know who aren't specialists in that would benefit from some more guidance i know i could probably do with a bit of a, a bit of direction sometimes on you know how to use some of the latest stuff um so yeah i think that's quite good and I, and I do think as a sort of communication tool it can be really effective for sharing stuff um and just thinking back to some of katie jordan stuff that went viral a lot of that was to do with it being easy to understand visually, I think. Okay, so do we have any more comments? I can't, still can't see the chat. So uh, sorry if, you've, if I've missed it in there. No. Uh, Deborah put in a, a link to um, a translation tool that, that isn't Google. So thanks for it, Deborah. Just kind of keep it, put that one on our list. Now. Okay, so um, I'm not sure if anyone else wanted to make any other contribution. So I think uh, perhaps we'll do a blog post about this team, it would be a good way to maybe catch a some of the suggestions that have been made and stuff. Um, and then it'll be there for anyone who wants to look later as well or wants to add to it later. Yeah, make sure to add links to that and to the resources you want to refer to and, uh, uh, and, and share in your, uh, uh, underneath your abstract in the Connect platform so everyone can, can view and access it. Maybe that's a good place to put it. And if there are no further questions, we still have plenty of time. Uh, but otherwise, uh, well, at least already, thank you to all the presenters. For, uh, Thanks, everyone. I think we can. Um, there are yeah, some I links we shared in the.